In today's episode, AI, the game changer for financial pros, uh, we are joined with Jonathan Michael, the CEO and founder of Wealth.io. Now I brought him on board because I was very interested in the marketing technology that he's bringing specifically for financial advisors uh, and also uh, insurance agents. Uh, I myself used to be a, a mortgage advisor and I know a little bit about what it took for me to find new clientele and to follow up and serve them. And so in this episode, we talk through not only what has inspired him to start the company, but how he ensures that his uh, full stack marketing technology is also compliant with current legislation, regulations. Uh, how does he uh, protect the client's data, which actually we'll talk about that because, you know, a lot of that is actually managed on the business's side. But how does he leverage uh, AI technology to pull in data that basically delivers more focused and targeted and relevant marketing content uh, for the, their clients? So, yeah, you won't want to miss this if you're in financial services and you're looking at seeing how AI is really innovating the industry and basically making your life easier stay tuned in this episode hey welcome to the startup voyage podcast and in today's episode ai the game changer for financial pros we'll deep dive into the transformative power of artificial intelligence in the financial industry now joining us today is jonathan michael the founder and ceo of wealth io and together we'll explore how ai is reshaping the landscape for investment advisors and independent insurance agents and revolutionizing the way they connect with clients and unlocking new opportunities. So Wealth IO is a full marketing stack built with generative AI, essentially a wealth management marketing technology that empowers financial advisors, wealth advisors, registered investment advisor firms, insurance marketing organizations, and insurance agents to serve more American households than ever before. So welcome to the show, Jonathan. Pleasure to hey, have you Arthur. here. Yeah, thanks yeah. for having me on. Appreciate it. Yes, yes. Uh, so why don't we just get started off? Uh, I'm very curious to um, understand or maybe give a brief introduction about your background and you know how did you conjure up this whole idea of wealth IO on your own? So I have a background in marketing and sales. I started my first company about 10 years ago with uh, you know it was a small business we bootstrapped it from 200 dollars in, ca in capital and you know it grew significantly year on year for like the first five years um hmm. and then around year five or so i was considering to transition across the world from india to the us um and in that transition process my father-in-law who's a financial advisor with with like 30 plus years of experience in the industry um, he was considering to, you know, grow his business and he wanted to scale his business, his firm, right? So he had a pretty sizable book of business, I think about 400 million assets under management, but he was trying to scale online using innovative marketing technologies, but he just couldn't find the right tools that he needed, right? The, all the automation and email and the, the marketing software was better email automation, better website content better social media content. And it turns out that that's not enough if you want to scale your firm online and serve more clients. And in, in, my, in my case, more American households specifically, right? So the idea was I'm an accidental SaaS founder, okay? This was not like intentional. It, what, we didn't have a grand master plan from day one. Uh, you know, we didn't consider raising $100 million from day one and, you know, scale and, you know, build a big company. That was not the goal. The goal was to build a simple product that advisors can use to capture attention fast. That's one of the core things that they struggled with is how can I capture attention from the average customer, from the average middle-class American who wants to save for retirement, plan for the kid's college, and you know have a decent life, right? So capturing the attention of that customer <laughs> was hard and they were finding, but they were trying to find new ways to uh, you know, capture that 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 attention gap, and we built a simple product, a simple lead magnet uh, that was going to you know be built for advisors so they can use it, get leads fast, and have more booked appointments. 
So we built an MVP in a few months and started validating it. And the goal was that we would build out this MVP. And if it works really well, we were going to sell it to one enterprise company and we were going to sail off into the sunset. That was the goal. I was not thinking of, you know, several markets and all of that. That was not part of the deal. Okay. It was just like a father-in-law and son-in-law kind of thing. I'm like, okay, cool. You're doing that. All right. I'll help you out. We'll do this X, Y, and Z, and then we'll figure it out. Right. Turns out that enterprise enterprise sales and SaaS is a different ball game. Okay. Um, and uh, the company that we were trying to sell to made a significantly low offer for the product, about a five figure offer for an annual licensing fee, or maybe it was a one-time fee. I think, I don't know, but it, it was very uninspiring. And I was like, I was like, you know what? I validated a product for a hundred million dollar plus market, maybe a billion dollar plus market. Okay. These RAs, they spend so much of money in marketing. I validated it with this company. It's a fortune 1000 company. I'll take, I'll take the last year and a half I spent building product for this company as market validation. And now I'm going to go and, you know, go to all our competitors. So that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of how the idea evolved, but the vision evolved over time a lot and it's become more clear now, but that's essentially how it got started off. It's very unconventional. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, just to put some understanding in the background of the people who would be using your software. So myself, I was in mortgage finance actually for several years. And I remember my approach, um, this is back in 08, 09, <laughs> right before the mortgage crisis. Um, but yeah, a lot of it was very face-to-face -face networking, going to events, asking for referrals. Um, it wasn't a lot online. Maybe I grew an email list, but do you tell me, I mean, what, what tools do advisors have to use these days? I and mean, what are they, what are they doing to access clients and how is what you're doing, giving them their, their competitive edge? Oh, that's a great question. So I do agree with you that the advisor uh, community moves a lot through referral uh, markets, right? So I think 86% of advisors depend on referrals to grow their uh, their firm. And what we are trying to do is really attack that top of the funnel layer, which a lot of companies are really not doing. A lot of companies in the marketing technology space and wealth management focus a lot on the middle layer and the end layer and the, sorry, the middle of the funnel prospecting technology and end of the funnel prospecting technology, which is essentially a lot of email automation and better email automation, right? What we are trying to build, and that's where we're going to see the magic of generative AI, because on the top of the funnel, we want to create, you, you want to create these amazing lead magnets, okay? Using these really cool lead magnets that are very specific to financial services, very domain specific to financial services. You create these lead magnets, you launch ads with generative AI. So the uh, AI should be able to create ad copy for you and creatives and ad creatives at scale. You launch these ads because you know the ICP, you know the ideal customer profile for the advisor. Now you have the AI has important data points that it can use to launch these ads on LinkedIn and Facebook specifically, because that's where I think most of their clients sit on. Once you launch these ads and you get all this lead data coming in, the yeah, we also have lead nurturing technology, right? So you have top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, and end of the funnel. We try to focus a lot on the top of the funnel, but then we try to use the top of the funnel data that is being collected to also drip down to the middle of the funnel data. Because if I collect all this lead data through ads and all these cool lead magnets that we have currently in our, in our tech stack, now I know what leads convert into clients and what don't, right? Right now, it's a very, you know, kind of pray and spray approach. Like I'll build an email list, okay? I'll send them all out, all these emails. And maybe the, the, the users who open, you know, my emails more are probably going to convert more, right? But I don't think that that's the best way to do it. I think a better way to do it is to use very uh, accurate data points um, and use those data points to, you know, build out your nurturing technology, which is essentially you know, better email marketing, more accurate email marketing. So I think that's the core differentiator is that we are trying to really hit the nail on the head with the top of the funnel prospecting so advisors can capture leads 
fast um and then still building out the rest but 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 also you know continuing the chain across the middle and end of the funnel so yeah. at the very top of the funnel is there um anything specific in which uh may say the user takes some type of a action answers some questions in order to yes. more or less qualify them right or to understand how to nurture them based on different segmentation so we have a yeah. tool called the financial intelligence number right and it's a simple calculator that really calculates your retirement number like how much of money you're going to need when you retire right so we apply parameters like inflation now we apply your current savings and investments the total money you've saved so far right and all of this is like through a fun quiz like format and it's super interactive mm -hmm. and engaging and fun and it brands the advisor really well so a lead magnet like that going you know going live on linkedin and facebook collects all the important data points for the advisor so they have context for that specific prospect but then ai can also use those data points to you know create customized content, more accurate ads and whatnot. So, yeah. Mm. So um, I think it's been stated, or I think this is something you've stated um, about like less than 30% of Americans uh, have interacted with um, an advisor uh, at some point uh, or another, uh, probably not even consistently. Um, why do you think it's so low? And is there just a culture where people, and I'm just gonna put it out there, uh, the new generation, it has this um, YOLO, <laughs> live for now. Uh, I'm not going to die with my money. There's a, you know, what I mean, it's been trending a little bit, you know, on social media and stuff. Um, are people just more focused on, you know, uh, spending the money and not really saving or what, what, what's your, what's your take? I think that a lot of Americans today are really intimidated when they think of planning for their financial lives because it's so cluttered. There is so much. I mean, just just put on your TV, right? Like, if you're watching the PGA Golf Tour, <laughs> between P between ads, there's at least two or three ads for a financial services company that offers you advisors and whatnot. And there's just so much. There's a plethora of choices that sometimes that when you have too much choice, you just don't know what what to choose. And mm -hmm. it's that. And it's also this assumption that they don't think they qualify or they are not wealthy enough to work with an advisor, right? Mm -hmm. So I think those are the top two reasons uh, why people are not actively working with an advisor. But the data clearly shows that 58% of people who choose to plan for retirement without an advisor, like I think 58, yeah, 80%, sorry, let me take back that data point. 80% of people who plan for retirement with when they work with an advisor always outperform the market as opposed to those who do it themselves, right? So that's a pretty yeah. significantly high number, like 80% of people. So you are more likely to plan better for retirement and have the money that you need for retirement if you do work with an advisor. So that's basically mm. what it is. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, if your business or your skill set is not in investing, what makes you think that you can do it? Now, if you start off really small and you try to learn, unless you're a guy right. that really uh, watches the market like all the time. And it, not only that, I mean, there's so many different investment options there's to, to learn, right? So definitely, mm -hmm. um, I I actually recommend advisors myself. I mean, I've 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 tried to invest my own, and it's 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 kind of um, a lot of effort going in, and then I get busy, and then if I'm not walking, right, you know, I I might put put some stops on, on some of my 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 uh, you know investments, but it's not really active, right? It's like it's just quite you know I'm just sitting there and not really doing much. Whereas at least an RA yeah. can kind of give you strategy, because that's the other thing you can buy stuff. You know, you can follow the context of, oh, buy into the companies that you already like. Um, or I've heard the, uh, why don't you just invest in ETFs, right? Uh, just It just diversifies and, you know, it doesn't move that much, but it'll, it'll help you grow, right? But that also isn't just, you can't just go with one strategy, right? It really depends. That's right. I think the best, I think you said it pretty well, but I think a more simplified illustration is uh, a fitness coach. 
right? Uh. Are you more likely to lose weight faster by yourself or with a personal trainer, right? It's the same thing. It doesn't have to be complicated for financial services. Yeah. Well, I guess these days, because of the popularity of YouTube, I think everyone thinks that they can do everything <laughs> in their own now. <laughs> yeah. Everyone thinks uh, they're a fitness. Yeah. Yeah. All these influencers. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's go back to your product then. You know, like, so AI has been getting a lot of noise and I think it's for sure raised concerns um, from, uh, from regulators, uh, from, you know, I guess the lawyers, anyone looking at data privacy and security. Um, so how, how does your product ensure that it is always focused uh, uh, to build or to have customer trust mm -hmm. first? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I think that because we build marketing technology, specifically in the wealth management space, in the advisory space, a lot of the sensitive data protocols don't apply to us a whole lot because we don't collect sensitive information like social security numbers or bank account information. We don't collect super sensitive personalized Personal ident personally identifiable user data, right? And we don't use that to train our models. We don't use that for anything really because it just doesn't exist. As far as data privacy is concerned, the training data that we use is primarily marketing content that is available on the web that we make available to our advisors. And the only data that we use to actually produce any kind of meaningful output for the advisor is data that they are already collecting using our tools and our technology, mm -hmm. right? And that is something that we've gained permission from, from the advisor. Like we're going to collect all these data points about your prospects, but we're going to use that prospect data to feed back into the system so that you have a more accurate model and you have better marketing content uh, that you can use to write emails to them, uh, whatever, whatever marketing efforts you want to, you know, um, implement. So, so that is my, that, that is a, a high level response to your question. Hmm. Well, but does I that think, mean, yeah, go ahead. I think that in the next 12 months or in the next 18 months, if there's any kind of legislation around this, it might change things a little bit. I don't know exactly if there's going to be an AI regulation body in the U.S. that is going to kind of lay, you know, set of ground rules for AI companies that might change it a whole lot, because essentially all the lang all the language models have essentially ingested the internet already, and this thing is already out in the wild. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so how how are your feelings then when it comes to um like Web three concepts? Like, so the whole idea is that the user, uh, if there was like a sovereign identity uh, created in which that it holds a user's all their buying behavior, medical, everything that they do, and they're able to basically monetize that data, giving it to let's say a financial services company, or in fact, you're able to actually take that. Uh, information and actually give more valuable information to that specific user based on the data that's tied to their identity. I mean, do you believe in a future that that could happen or is it, and, and basically the user is giving you permission to access certain data sets within their, their identity. Do you, do you think that would be like, I, I feel think, like that would be yeah. a game changer. Yeah. It could be a game changer, but I think the trajectory of data privacy and data protection sh shows the exact opposite trend. Yeah. And I think Apple led the way in some in you know uh, in some instances when they released all their you know updates last last year with you know app privacy and you know not letting apps you know use your data and stuff. I think and I think the GDPR laws in in the EU have also led with that a lot. So what you're explaining, like in under GDPR laws, that would be impossible. That's like a no brainer. It would be like, no way, heck no. You are not going to use any of my data points for anything. Um, so I think that I, I think that as we move forward, like in this new AI age, I think everybody who's build, building meaningful AI systems, they all know that data is the key. That is 
the foundation to build any sort of meaningful AI system, right? And so I think that, I, I think it's going to become more and more closed. I think anything that's personally identifiable, if I'm a company, if I am, say, a Vanguard and I have unique information about my user base, I'm not going to share that with anybody because that is that is what sets me apart. That's That's my unique value proposition, right? So I don't see a world where, you know, personally identifiable personally identifiable information can be available to other systems that talk to each other unless the user explicitly gives permission to do that. And I think the trend shows that people would rather keep that data to themselves and maybe younger generations don't care a whole lot. I think Gen Z probably doesn't care a whole lot. But yeah, that's kind of my response to that. Yeah, all right. I mean, like, so we, we talked about in legislation maybe changing in the future, and we all know financial services, there's a lot of complex regulations and compliance requirements. So how do you ensure your product is always in compliance uh, with the, all these changes that are happening, especially dealing with the, the sensitive, you know, financial information? That's a billion dollar question. <laughs> And I think that's why we're going to build a meaningful company here. Because, so if you ask me, what is your, uh, who's your target set on, Jonathan? Like, what is your, who, what are you going against? I think every startup today needs to have something to go against. You have something to go towards, which is their vision. But you also want to attack something in the system that's just wrong and doesn't work. Marketing agencies don't work for financial services companies, Okay. I don't care how great these marketing agencies are. I think they are going to be redundant in the next two years if they don't evolve into becoming AI agencies. Okay. So it's either one or the other. I'll tell you why. Because a lot of these marketing agencies, and if you talk to a lot of these marketers, right, these freelance marketers and content creators and whatnot, they don't understand the financial services space as, as, space as much as they need to, to work in it and to serve as outsourced marketers, right? Because no matter how great, like, like, yeah, I, like, if you look at oh if you look at GPT four, right? I see a lot of webinars today with advisors hosting or you know, people in the marketing space hosting uh content, uh hosting webinars around using GPT four for your firm. And that really makes me squirm in my seat because that sounds scary. Okay. It is not compliant. These models are pulling in content from God knows which blog or which, you know, influencer bro on the internet that created, you know, some kind of, you know, news, news article around saving for retirement or, you know, I don't know, planning for, you know, your kid's college savings fund or whatever. And so it's pulling in all this data from all these models that we don't know where the source is coming from. And then you create content around that and you post it on your on your website. It's non-compliant. It's not going to be, you know, if 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 you were to submit that content, uh, that, that document to say FINRA, they're probably not going to approve it because of several factors, right? So I think solving compliance is integral to uh, building meaningful AI systems in the wealth management marketing space. And that is a very difficult problem to solve. And I'm happy that it's a difficult problem to solve because if it is not a difficult problem to solve, then you are not going to build any meaningful AI system in today's world because then you're just hitting off some silly API and creating output and you look like a million other AI companies. So that is going to be a core differentiator for our company is we are going to use Findra's uh, machine readable rule set for their advertising regulation uh, laws specifically, and we are going to run this model through with compliance officers. We're going to work with a host of compliance officers to have them review it and make sure it's continually compliant. And I think it's going to be an amazing tool, an amazing assistant for compliance officers that work in companies, because now uh, they can have their firms creating all kinds of content. And for the most part, it can be compliant, but you know, it will still go go through a review process that's going to be so much more faster as opposed to a manual process where they have to read every line. So right. I think that's uh, I think we're going to build compliance into the model, and it's going to be an extremely hard job, but we're going to do it. Yeah, 
I, I think that would be like a very high value proposition of the uh, of what you're building because I actually th went through it myself. Uh, I work for a, a licensed securities exchange, a digital mm -hmm. one. Um, and yeah, I was uh, the, the CMO. I would create content. I had to give it to my head of compliance. They maybe didn't have time or, you know, like I had to wait for the return of that information. Then sometimes I would have to debate, yes. you know, like what can and can't be used. And then sometimes we had to escalate it. It was like, it took so long. It was so painful. I just, I just couldn't, I just couldn't continue with that. Right. So then I would always, um, I was extremely conservative after some time. I didn't even try to go on any bleeding edge because I just didn't, didn't want to go through the process. And then the, the, the quality of content kind of suffered more, more or less, right? It was really hard to maintain something that was like, like, you know, new and updated, um, not for the sake of not trying. It just, it was just a lot of process and there's a lot of other problems I had to solve. I didn't realize that you understood the pain point so well. I think you've been through it. I mean, that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly how I explain it to people like this yeah. manual process, like you want to create a piece of content, you submit to the compliance officer, they take three weeks to get back to you. And da, 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 da. It's like, I come know on, exactly. I, I've been through it. I've been... <laughs> I know. I mean, um, anyway, so, so I guess, uh, I mean, I think you made, a, I really love the point of how there's so many companies just uh, using open AI tools, and they're pulling from the same data sets. And yes, I get it. It's still very new and they're testing it out. But I think that's why there's, um, uh, you know, critics are saying, uh, uh, critics of AI saying, you know, there's all these biases that are, are being created mm -hmm. based on what they're finding on the internet, a lot of it which are not even validated, like you said, the source. And so they're building all this content or pushing out all this information. Um, and I've heard this from lawyers too. Uh, it's almost like some of these AI engines that they had used to look at um, historical uh, uh, case cases in the past. They came back with like inaccurate information. <laughs> so yeah. I, yes, it's still early days, right? Early days. So there's a oh. story of two lawyers from California who actually got disbarred for using oh, right? ChatGPT <laughs> in a brief, and they they cited oh, like they cited inaccurate uh, uh, case history, and they got disbarred. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so, but so you want to check out Harvey uh, Harvey dot AI? That's okay. a new AI um, system, a new AI company that is going to probably transform uh, legal practices and Har the way Harvey. we interpret law. Okay, Harvey yeah. uh, Harvey dot AI. Okay. Uh, yeah, Harvey AI. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure what the domain is, but all right. I thought I think they're working on something pretty interesting. Cool. Cool. All right, so um, let's move on to like sort of like uh, from the customer's point of view, right? So like I said, mentioned before, a lot of uh, referral marketing and, hey, maybe catch me on uh, Facebook. I know a buddy of yours. He thought, you know, you'd be uh, someone that I could help, you know, things like this. Um, but how do you, how do, like a lot of America, surprisingly, uh, still has, I guess, a challenge of access to technology in general, or maybe they don't access it that much. So, um, I mean, how do you imagine serving those type of customers? I mean, it, that, that are a little bit harder to reach, um, you know? So, yeah, I think that's a good question. And so as a marketing technology company, our vision is really clear like we have a very clear quantifiable vision and mission, right? We want to help the next 5,000 registered investment advisors, independent registered investment advisors, acquire 40 new clients every year over the next five to six years. And if we do that, we'll maybe impact a million households. The way we think, the way we think we're going to do it is by empowering advisors with scalable marketing technology. And that is not just ads. It's not just ad generation. Right, I think ads is one piece to it, so that advisors can achieve scale. But because of these AI models, now advisors can create content like never before. And I think their job profile has changed a little bit towards becoming amazing thought leaders in their space, in their vertical, in their unique service offering, so that people can read their content and look to them for advice and for input and whatever, right? 
I think most, I think if you look at America today, I think, I think the percentage of people that are not on the internet is maybe three or 4% of Americans, I think. I think it's 3.5 if I'm not mistaken, right? The majority of Americans who have investable assets are on the internet, right? They're on Facebook specifically. I think that's a very overlooked medium because a lot of the people with the money are really on Facebook because the boomers sit on Facebook, right? Um, and Facebook and LinkedIn specifically. But I think that if advisors can think, can have a sort of mindset shift and see how they can leverage all these AI models to create way more content at quarter of the price, way faster, then I think they can get more eyeballs looking at their content and draw, you know, it, I, I, you know, draw, um, you know, attention. And I think that some of these things are going to remain con like foundational and constant. Like you cannot, you cannot stop doing the consistent hard work of creating content and building authority, establishing authority for yourself in this space, right? I think those things are going to remain the same unless, unless you're part of a Wells Fargo or a Goldman Sachs or a JP Morgan where everything is cookie cutter, it's all in place. They have the clients, you show up, you serve them, bam, over, right? But if you're an independent RIA, which is the fastest growing market in the RIA space, compounding, I think, at 2,000 or 3,000 new firms every year because more registered investment advisors, they want to go independent. They're like, screw you, Goldman Sachs, screw you, JP Morgan. We don't want to work with your you know, monolithic structures and your archaic base of doing business. They're going to go independent and be entrepreneurs. Those are the people we want to work with, and they, they are the key. They are the future uh, because they're going to be able to do advisory in a creative way that, the previous generation was not able to do. And especially right, to right. be able to reach Gen Z and millennials, like Gen Z, you, you, there are so many Gen Z kids today who are like working in software companies and whatnot, like in their early 20s, who want financial advice and they don't know where to find it. They don't know how to find it because where do they go to first? Their app. They want to look for apps. They want to look for mobile first methods of communication. And I think that's where mm. we are. we are also going to be able to help advisors reach Gen Z uh, in a unique way. So that sounds, that sounds um, like a, a delivery that I think you guys could actually handle. I think for most people, I think you're right. Um, just if you just ask people in general, um, you know, what type of work have you put in to secure your, your financial feature, right? Or what type of planning? And usually what I hear is like, oh, I really want to do something. I just don't know where to start. Right, because yeah. the idea is like, oh, I got to do it myself. <laughs> that, I think that's that's usually the problem. Uh, and then, you know, they don't know. I said, well, yeah, you can you you can be part of that uh, the process, but you know, you need to find someone actually who who has the knowledge to help you. Right. So I think right. I think for sure. Um, and I guess uh, coming down to the quality of the content, I guess that is uh, then delivered through your platform. How much um, customization uh, is there? Because Right now, uh, when I've been interviewing many CEOs um, are using AI within their organization, uh, and I think it's, it's changed a little bit, but they're saying, you know what? We don't need that many marketing people. We just need to hire some high school person who is very hungry, uh, basically, you know, saving costs, and then just give them and direct them, uh, give them all these tools and direct them on what needs to happen. So then, yeah, they use AI. They're producing all this content. Of course, so maybe a higher up, more experienced person needs to kind of massage it a little bit. But then when everyone's going, let's say everyone's on you're pulling from chat GPT, it seems like it's from the same data set, same idea, same concepts, right? And sometimes, yes, that's the reality, but I think who delivers it actually makes a huge difference. So is there a lot of personalization, customization from your platform? How does that work? Yes. Yes, that's, uh, this is a, another great question. I think I'm going to say something pretty controversial and it's going to sound a little controversial at start, but great. I think the best AI models are going to be biased mm. to your unique use case. Okay. The best AI models are going to be super biased. And what I mean by that is like for financial services, you need a model for that. Okay. For medical services, healthcare, you need a separate model for that. 
And it's not just the AI engineers and researchers and machine learning people and NLP people who need to be working on those models. You also want to have the research community deeply involved to verify the output, right? And I think the more you have these domain-specific thought leaders in each domain, I think you can increase output of the economy at large, right? Because I think you're, you, what you said is right. Like everyone's hitting off these APIs and the output looks the same. But the key, I think what's going to be the unique differentiator, like for example, for us, what, what's going to be our unique differentiator is that we are we have set the chart, we have set the course to build our own model, okay? We, we feel like there's no choice. We feel like there's no choice, especially with the release of Llama 2, Meta's new open source model. Uh, I mean, we feel like we have no choice but to build a domain-specific large language model that we can, it's it's a long-term play. And I think that, you know, I think we'll benefit long-term. It's like laying the digital railroads for the 21st century, mm-hmm. right? That's kind of what I feel like every specific industry vertical needs to do. And I think there are companies who are probably doing it for their own vertical. But yes, the marketing costs have dramatically dropped. You don't need a 10-member team. You maybe need a three-member team or a five-member team. Um, And I think if you know how to prompt it with your unique data sets, I'm like, you should not like, this is not like, this is not an anti-GPT, you know, rant, okay? I think GPT-4 is amazing. Like, it's awesome. It's really awesome and produces amazing output when you are the unique differentiator. If you ask GPT-4, create me content for the real estate market in America today, and it's going to create you a bunch of whatever, right? But then if you have a unique data set of knowledge that you have, that you have gathered over the years, that you are learning every day, and then you collect that data and then you feed it into GPT and you're like, hey, create me content around all these parameters and you feed it all the parameters, right? That's where you see the magic of GPT really come to play. Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of people actually are missing. And I guess that's why, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there's all this um, uh, talk or uh, there's actually a lot of services now helping people with uh, prompts, right? Just being like a better, uh, a prompt engineer. <laughs> there's, there's a call. Prompt it. engineering. That's right. <laughs> but that's that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. But I think that's, a, that's very well put because for sure, you know, the tool is a tool. It's always the person uh, that's using it and what they get out of it. And that's the one thing I've always learned, uh, even with any marketing tool. I remember one time uh, I was in conversations to decide uh, to subscribe to HubSpot, right? They go through, hey, look, there's all this cool stuff, automation, turn it on and off and everything. And yes, it always sounds great. It can do all this stuff. And it's not until you actually really get into it uh, that you actually recognize um, it's in potential inconsistencies, any like limitations uh, based on what you're, how you're trying to use it. Um, sometimes you're kind of questioning if the automation is working based on the parameters that you set. Sometimes, you know, you, you, just, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you learn, you just don't know. But the more time you spend on the tool uh, and you become an expert, then you you know exactly what you need to do to get what you need to get out of it, right? So... Um, so that's a very good yeah. point. Yeah. So I so I think HubSpot is going to be one of the more defining marketing companies in the next five years, ten years. I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I think that. So you, you mentioned since you mentioned HubSpot. I have to say that I think HubSpot, their entire technology stack is going to be completely built into conversational AI. So they have a product called chatspot.ai now. So I follow the founder, Dharmesh Shah, on LinkedIn. He bought the domain for chat.com. I think he spent like $100 million or something. I'm, I'm maybe not a... <laughs> wait, I could be exaggerating. It's probably not $100 million. It's maybe $10 million. I don't know. But... I know it was a seven figure or six figure, uh, six or seven figure amount, but what they are trying to do, I think the future of these dashboards, because of conversational AI models and because of natural language processing, essentially, right? Because of these NLP models, 
like all these complex automation softwares like HubSpot and Salesforce and all these different tools, right? They're all going to become a chat interface. It's going to be the future of user interface design. It's just going to be these chatbots everywhere. Like write me an email campaign for, uh, you know, my free trial users, right? Bam, it's going to create you all these email campaigns. And I think that's the direction that HubSpot is going in. And it's it's going to change the game. It's, uh, it's kind of scary. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is scary. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine now like in HubSpot, instead of me having to learn how to use the tools, you're telling the tool what you want, right? Yes. <laughs> and it, that's and then what that's we're <laughs> yeah, that's what you're building. Oh, that we're building. We're gonna have it live in three to four months. In three to yeah, four months, yeah. I told my team this. I'm like, guys, you look at all these tabs. So I showed them my dashboard. Right, we got in a stand up yeah. call, and I showed them the dashboard. I showed them all these tabs. Okay, you guys see all these tabs on the left? It's yeah. going away. Why? <laughs> because our users they already have steep uh, learning adoption. Like technology adoption is already super steep. Okay. Why, why, why take them through to tutorials and help articles and all that <laughs> stuff when you can just, you know, conversational AI the thing, right? Chat UX, chat user experience, right? Why, why can't we just make this entire dashboard experience a conversational chat? And I think that's right. the direction we're heading towards. And probably when you log into the Wealth.io app in a year from now, it's probably just going to be Anna, our AI, uh, you know, who's our co-pilot. We say, you know, that's how we pitch our company, right? We are building the first... AI marketing co-pilot for registered investment advisors. And it's just going to be Anna mm. and you text Anna and Anna's going to give you whatever you want uh, for your wealth tire system. Yep. Yeah. That's that. That's, uh, I can't wait to see that. Well, how far do you think, um, I guess, AI would be in, I guess, uh, in the advisor's role when they're providing strategy or like, you know, basically <laughs> uh, investment sort of like, you know, the kind of like advice, right? So maybe more mm -hmm. direct advice. It's not this beyond marketing um, because, you know, I mean, every, I guess every single uh, advisor is going to potentially look at things differently uh, and may have their own recommendations. Yes. Um, do, do you think AI has a, a chance of kind of taking over <laughs> these RA roles to Actually, some degree? I, I, I think that it's going to answer a lot of the basic questions that people have. <laughs> Yeah. Obviously, it's going to make yeah. it, it's going to reduce time for the advisor, like instead of explaining basic concepts, like the rule of 72, for example, mm. it's a rule of compound interest, why you should be investing in ETFs, for example, because they compound mm. over time. And so having to explain that to like people over like several years can be quite, I don't know how some of these advisors <laughs> do it. I mean, they explain the same concept year in, year out, right? <laughs> but I think that in the future, we're probably going to see AI models. And this yeah. is, I think, this is an interesting product feature ad that I think I just came to me right now on the pod. But uh, I think that you can integrate your unique brand voice, your unique uh, protocols into the model, like in your onboarding, you know, you can have the advisor essentially input things that they don't want the AI to tell their users, tell their prospects, yeah. right? Like, don't touch, don't mention this, the, you know, these are my unique service offerings. These are my unique yeah. core competencies, right? These are the things I'm really good at. Oh, well, let me just give you a document. Here's a 30-page a document about all the things that I believe are good sound, fine, uh, good sound investment advice. Integrate that into your output, right? So I think that that can be truly transformative because it can reduce the time spent for the advisor to ask, uh, for the advisor to answer right. basic questions. So I think it is going to be, I think there is a solid use case for it, mm, but it's mm. not 100% like use case. Sure. There are some, there are some wannabe uh, people out there, you know, they like using, the, the wannabe people love using the word disruption. <laughs> they don't really understand what it really means. Right. But I, I, I can tell you a quick story of this silly investor that I met is wannabe. So you have these wannabe angel investors today that want to invest in AI. And there's one, one specific investor, he was like, well, why not just completely disrupt the advisor model, right? Why not just completely disrupt the advisor model? And this guy worked in real, he had real estate investments, right? So I asked him, I'm like, okay, well, would you completely disrupt real estate agents? Would you put them all up, uh, all, all out of jobs? If you can have AI replace real estate, right? Would you like to, so so I asked him, I'm like, um, 
So, Mr. Angel Investor, would you like to take a tour, a, a, a house tour with a robot? Would you like a robot to close a deal for you on a million dollar home? And he and he very arrogantly said, yeah. And I'm like, come on, <laughs> there's no way. There's no way you're going to do that. Right. Yeah. So yeah. same thing, same thing applies Ooh. here. Like, yeah. you know, you can't remove the human loop. The human loop is going to be part of it. Like human advisors are key. Um, but I think they're going to be able to just serve a lot more people. Mm. Yeah. Well, when I related to when I was a, a mortgage finance, um, a mortgage advisor, I can imagine uh, just having a chat where you're basically asking questions as far as like, okay, here, here, here's my information. Uh, give me the the best product that is out there. Uh, this is the the payment that I can afford. Um, if I refinance now, um, am I am I uh, out out money for a bit that that I basically need to recoup? You know, because I'm I'm paying points. You know, all this stuff. I think it can really be answered by some yeah. engine, right? I mean, you don't need all that. And actually. When I was an advisor, I, I don't want to go through all that stuff and and calculate yep. everything. Actually, I, I'd rather go through more higher valued information, right? It's more of like, okay, I'll help you with your financing, but let's strategize. Um, you know, do you need to take some cash out? Do you want to buy another property? And I'd rather do stuff like that than trying to figure <laughs> out all the the maths behind it, right? So, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, the math okay. behind it. Um, yeah. I think the the computational, yeah, the, like the the math behind it can be done uh, through AI, yeah. not with GPT, definitely mm. not with GPT four, because GPT four sucks at math, and I believe <laughs> it's getting worse and worse at math. Yeah, because they're trying to save on <laughs> no, this is serious. Like I think yeah. they're trying to save on compute or something, and it's actually right. getting worse at math. But right. I think using like a Wolfram API, which is uh, that you do a lot of computational calculations, a lot of algorithmic calculations can be used in this kind of a use case where advisors can, you know, hit those APIs and have, uh, you know, uh, robo advisors do a lot of automated rebalancing, tax loss harvesting, and all that, which is already there, honestly. Like a lot okay. of these robots already do that, but it's right. merging both worlds together really well. That's the that's the hard job. Sure, sure. Okay, well, you know, we're about the, at the end of the podcast and, um, you cool. know, I want to thank you for uh, having your time and presence and your knowledge shared with our uh, audience. Uh, any last words you want to add? I mean, uh, any new developments, any new announcements? Yes. So <laughs> I, I had a team member recently, like he said, uh, we were talking about we were talking about data analytics, and we were talking about really looking being a being da a data driven company, right? And we're a super small early stage team, very scrappy operation. And he said, "Oh, maybe we need a data analyst," and it really drove me nuts. I'm like, "That's the most stupid thing I've heard all week long," and I sent him a. <laughs> Uh, I sent him a video to, uh, uh, you know, the GPT-4's new code interpreter release, which is insane. You feed it, you download a CSV file of your company's data. It's, imagine like Stripe data, right? You download all the Stripe data, you feed it to GPT-4, to the code interpreter, and it will literally create pie charts for you, giving you information and insights about your company. So I think wow. what I would like to tell, yeah, it's in, it's insane. Like data analysts, data analysts are going away in 12 months. I, they're not going to, yeah. like data analytics is gone, okay? <laughs> so anyway, so what I told him was you need to be on the trend. You need to be, there are new updates every day. So what I would tell your audience is is to, you know, try to stay updated as much as you can because this thing is, this is moving insanely fast, unlike any kind of industrial revolution we've seen before. So there has to be a sense of urgency and desperation to learn as much as you can. So you know what you need to do uh, to implement AI in your business. That's what I would say. Cool. All right. Hey, thanks for sharing that. Um, and Jonathan, a uh, pleasure to have you on. And maybe we'll check back uh, in with you in the uh, next six, six to months. eight months. Yeah, six months. Good, good timing, good timing. All right, thanks a lot. Yep.
All right. Thank you, Arthur. This, this was awesome. Great questions. And I look forward to keeping in touch. Hey, so that concludes this episode of the Startup Voyage podcast. I would like to thank all of you for listening to this episode. And I'd really appreciate it if you leave any type of comments um, that you'd like to share because it helps to feedback on how I deliver um, these podcasts. And I definitely want to improve it uh, to continue to add more value to the audience. Now, you can follow us on many of the popular podcast channels, Spotify, Amazon, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. Uh, equally, I'm going to be uploading all these episodes onto YouTube. Uh, so it's more than just audio, it's video. You can see everyone's faces. Um, look, I really hope that you enjoyed this episode. Um, and I'm always open to new ideas or um, looking for new guests. So if you know anyone in the space of Web3 that is an influencer or a leader or someone who's really trying to shape what Web3 will be in the future, I'd love to hear from them. All right. So yeah, just comment below. Um, you can DM me. Uh, I have all my information in the details underneath this uh, podcast episode. So yeah, thank you for joining me today and have a great one. See you in the next episode.